In this video, I'd like to make a few comments on question 3C of Class Activity 1. So let me first recall for you what problem 3C said. It said that given any propositional forms P and Q, the negation of P ended with Q is equivalent to uh, the negation of P ORD with the negation of Q. Okay, so that's the second of the De Morgan laws. And um, in an earlier question, you had given a direct proof of this just simply by working out the truth table of it. And um, I wanted you to show a second proof um, which made use of these two facts here. One, that for any propositional form P, the negation of the negation of P is equivalent to P. And for any pair of propositional forms R and S, the negation of R ORD with S is equivalent to the negation of R ANDed with the negation of S. So I'm going to give three proofs of this. The first one is an incorrect proof, and so I want to um, point out some mistakes that people often make when they're writing proofs. Um, the second two will be correct proofs. And in those proofs, I'm going to um, make use of this notation. This I'm going to refer to this thing as 1. I'm going to refer to this thing as i, and this thing here as double i. So you might want to make a note of what 1, i, and double i are before we go on. And also to remember that 1 is what I'm trying to prove, and i and double i is what I'm assuming to be true. Okay, so here is what I would call an incorrect proof of the result. So what is incorrect about this proof? Well, in a properly written proof, everything that you write should be able to be interpreted as a grammatically correct sentence. Even, even though we're allowed to use notation, one should still be able to interpret what we write as a sentence. And so it's not um, a good proof to just simply write a string of equivalences without any explanation in between. You really cannot interpret what you see here as English sentences. The second thing that, it, that is not good about this particular proof is that it isn't clear when, when I write something down if it's something that I know to be true or something that I'm trying to prove is true. When you write something in a proof, the reader can only assume that you're saying that it's true. You're not saying that you hope that it's true, but rather you're saying that it is true. And so when you write this in your proof, you're saying that it's true. But the fact is, this is exactly what it is that you're trying to prove. So at the point that you write this, you don't know that it's true. It's what you want to prove is true. And so you don't have the right to put this down in your proof until you know that it's true. So now look at the things that you've written here. Which ones is it evident that it's true? Well, if you look at the very last one, this is clearly a true statement. And assuming that this is true, how could we then deduce this one here? Well, by I, if I just simply replace P by not not P and Q by not not Q, I, I obtain this statement here. And I know that that's the case because I'm assuming that I is true. So I have the right, after writing this, I have the right to write this. Now how could I go from here to here, well, the left-hand side is the same as this left-hand side, again by I, and this right-hand side is the same as this right-hand side by double I. Now, how can I go from here uh, to here? Well, I could put one extra tilde on both sides. If I put an extra tilde on the left, I get three tildes, and by I, two of those tildes collapse, and I get this. Similarly, um, and, and similarly, I put the extra tilde on the right-hand side, and 
uh, by putting an extra tilde on the right-hand side, I get two tildes, and they collapse down again by I, and that then gives me this. So one way to fix this so-called proof is, in fact, to write everything in exactly the opposite order. In other words, this proof is written completely backwards. If I first wrote this, then this, then this, and then this, I would be able to turn that into a correct proof. The only problem would be that I haven't written it. Um, you couldn't interpret it as sentences. It's just a string of equivalences, and that's not okay. But the, the main point I'm, writing, I'm making here is that you've written it completely backwards. Okay, so now let me turn to some correct proofs of this. So as I was going around from table to table um, and answering your questions about question 3C, the hint that I gave you was to apply formula 2 in which R is replaced by not P and S is replaced by not Q. That was the hint that I gave you. And this particular proof that you see here is a formal proof that makes use of that hint. So let's read through it together. The proof starts as follows. Let P and Q be given propositional forms. Suppose 1 and 2 hold, and we will prove that 1 holds. Okay, so I'm telling the reader what I'm assuming and what it is I'm trying to prove. And now I'm going to make a little bit more explicit what I mean by 2, just to remind the reader. Thus, we are given that for all propositional forms R and S, we have this. That's just a statement of this 2 here. Applying this with R equal to not P and S equal to not Q, we obtain this. So all I've done is I've copied this down again, and wherever I saw an R, I replaced it by not P, here and here, and wherever I see an S, I replaced it by not Q, here and here. So the right side is by 1 equivalent to P wedge Q, you see, because it's not not P here and it's not not Q here. And so we obtain this. So all I've done is I've copied this down again, but I instead of writing this, I wrote P wedge Q. Now, applying the negation to both sides gives, so now I've just simply copied this down again, but I put an extra tilde on both sides. And so I put a comma. And so by applying 1 to the left side, we get what? Well, I'm just copying this out again, but I'm just not writing the double tilde by 1. So we get this is equivalent to that, as desired. This completes the proof. So you'll notice in this proof, uh, if you read it from top to bottom, Everything can be interpreted as a grammatically correct English sentence, even though I'm making use of certain notations as I go. You can still read it as, a, as an English sentence. So let's now turn to the second proof. And um, as I was talking to one student, um, the student said, is there some way to write the proof so that we can work directly with the thing that we're trying to prove? Uh, not the entire thing. Don't write down the entire thing, but just write down part of it. In other words, start with one side of it and show that you can deduce that it's equal to the other side. And um, so the answer is yes, you can do that. So let me now write you a proof in which I begin with this and I deduce that it's equal to this. Let me show you that proof. So here, here's the proof. Let P and Q be propositional forms, then I start with this. So this is the left-hand side of the thing that I want to prove. So all I've done is I've copied it down again, but wherever I see a P, I put tilde tilde P, and where I see a Q, I put tilde tilde Q. So I have the right to say that this is equivalent to this by, by I. And now, you'll see a tilde here and a tilde here, and there's an and in between. So by 2, I have the right to say that that's the tilde of the or of, of this thing here. Okay, so that's exactly what 2 says. But now you see, 
um, I have these brace brackets, and outside the brace bracket I have a double tilde. So by I, that double tilde collapses, and so this goes away, and we're just left with that, which I've written here. And that's exactly what it is that we were trying to prove. I've proved that this is equivalent to this, and so that completes the proof. So this is, I guess, the most elegant proof of all. It's the shortest proof, and you'll notice everything can be interpreted as an English sentence. And secondly, everything you see written here is something that I know to be true. There's no wishful thinking in anything that I've written here.